Thank you very much, Claire, and thanks to everyone who made this uh, workshop possible. It's really an extraordinary bringing together of expertise, and um, I am delighted to be part of it. Um, as Claire said, with the thousands of pages of both the statute and the regulations, we could spend easily the rest of the day, if not the rest of the week, talking about the Affordable Care Act and what it means for adolescents and young adults, but I'm going to try to give a quick overview in the next 15 minutes or so, and then leave plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, before I begin, I would like to give special thanks to one of my colleagues at uh, UCSF who uh, worked together with me on an issue brief last fall after the Supreme Court decision um, on the Affordable Care Act came out and has been enormously helpful. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is talk about three things. First of all, how does, or at least how can, the ACA improve the health insurance status of young adults? Second, how does the ACA, or how can the ACA, uh, improve access to important health care services for young adults? And finally, what are the most important upcoming challenges to make sure that young adults gain health insurance coverage and receive needed services? And I think the challenges are just as important, if not more important, than the actual provisions of the act that hold out so much promise. So in terms of health insurance, coverage, both adolescents and young adults are insured at lower rates than younger children, but um, these few piece, points of data illustrate that young adults are really lagging way behind adolescents. So only two-thirds of young adults had continuous coverage in, for a year in 2011, um, and a third were uninsured for all or part of the year. That coverage broke down into uh, both private and public coverage, and you can see that half of young adults, not that different in terms of a percentage from adolescents, had private coverage in 2011, uh, but a dramatically lower percentage had public coverage. And that's where we really need to be looking very carefully at what the uh, ACA will be able to do and what it actually will do. So expanded coverage under the Affordable Care Act can address the health insurance needs of young adults both through private health insurance coverage and public health insurance coverage. Um, in particular, coverage to age 26 on a family policy, which went into effect right after the uh, act was passed in 2010, has made a big difference already. And then the potential exists for the health insurance exchanges and the subsidies that are available through those exchanges to begin to make a big difference in 2014. And we'll look at that a little more closely in just a moment. In the public arena, the um, promise of the ACA was the Medicaid expansion, which was modified significantly by the uh, United States Supreme Court in its decision last, last June, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, there also was a provision for states to have to at least continue to do what they have been doing in the past, in other words, maintain the effort they have been making with respect to Medicaid coverage, and that's an important provision, which I'll mention again. So in terms of the private health insurance arena, you all know there is an individual mandate, and that was upheld as constitutional by the United States Supreme Court, and that individual mandate means that if you don't have the required coverage um, of health insurance, you can be subject to a financial penalty. The coverage uh, for those who don't have it through their employers uh, or through Medicaid can be available through these health insurance exchanges at varying levels of sort of richness of coverage, um, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. But a particularly important uh, element to mention is that 
the Affordable Care Act allows for catastrophic, quote unquote, plans to be offered um, for the young adult age group up to age 30, which have much more limited benefits and presumably lower cost, but have some um, problems associated with them because of the limited nature of the benefits. In order to encourage young people to enroll, and people of all ages to enroll, there are subsidies available both for premiums and for cost sharing um, for people up to either 250 percent of poverty for the cost sharing assistance or 400 percent of poverty for the premium tax credits. Um, the most notable effect so far has been this age 26 provision, which has resulted in slightly more than 3 million young people being covered um, by December 2011. So that's been a big uh, advance um, for that age group, which was really significantly underinsured prior to that. In terms of public health insurance, prior to the ACA, um, Medicaid was covering very, very low levels of income for single adults. And um, after the ACA, Medicaid is required to cover up to 133% for up to 18, but um, it's now a state option for whether Medicaid will be expanded for this age group. Originally, that was mandated for all states. Now it's an option. Um, in addition, there are groups that uh, will be left out even if states do expand Medicaid. So for example, undocumented immigrants and immigrants who have been here less than five years will not be covered. Former foster youth um, must be covered by all states up to uh, age 26, paralleling the private insurance provision. So what is it that the ACA will provide? Well. Uh, it requires that there be 10 essential health benefits offered through the exchanges, and also those must be available in the Medicaid expansion states um, for the newly eligible populations. Here are the, here's the list, and it includes some things that are extremely important for young adults, as Charlie illustrated in his um, presentation just now, uh, but there are some things that are that are left out, for example, oral and vision care, which is very important, is only required to be covered for the pediatric population, not the young adult population. Preventive services must be covered without cost sharing in private health plans, uh, but only if they're uh, obtained through in-network providers. And again, the absence of um, really clear guidelines for the young adult population means that there's um, some gaps in terms of what will be available without cost for the young adult population, although there's some very important services that are covered. Um, sexual and reproductive health services, uh, there are some that are covered without, must be covered without cost sharing as preventive services. Um, but when we get to the comments and questions, we can talk about what are some of the limitations on this, because what's covered is screening, and that may not cover uh, all of what is needed in terms of follow-up and treatment without cost. Um, maternity care is covered, but abortion is with significant limitations, and that can be an important service for this age group to, to be considering. So, for the rest of my time, I really want to talk about what the challenges are for the young adult population. And really, with each of these areas that I'm going to mention very briefly, there is vast potential for additional research to be conducted and additional um, knowledge to be gained as this uh, very important piece of legislation rolls out in its implementation. We just, there are many, many unanswered questions about how it will or won't really benefit the young adult population, and this is something we need to be looking at very closely in real time as it happens, um, and both for purposes of 
uh, informing policymakers about what changes might need to happen and also informing the advocacy world about what kind of work needs to be done to ensure that the promises of this legislation are met for this population. So I'll just talk about a few of the challenges related to expansion of health insurance and related to access to health care services. So this individual mandate which got so much attention and which was upheld as constitutional by the United States Supreme Court applies to individuals who do not have other coverage that, that qualifies unless those individuals are exempt. Um, it's enforceable by financial penalties through the Internal Revenue Service. There's an exemption, however, if your income is so low that you don't meet the income tax filing threshold, which this year, if it were this year, it would be in the somewhat between nine and $10,000 a year. And there would be young adults falling into that exempt category for sure. The important factor, though, is that the penalties are less than the cost of the premiums, even factoring in the subsidies. And since many young adults are already reluctant to purchase health insurance coverage, largely because of cost, partly because they may think they don't really need it or they won't get sick or they won't have an accident, so for that reason, the young adult compliance with the mandate is really not certain. And it may turn out to be a very critical factor in terms of encouraging young people to purchase policies so that the premium costs for everyone, including young adults, can be kept lower because they need to be part of the pool. And Massachusetts, for example, really made a huge effort to get young people to enroll in their Massachusetts um, health care reform. Uh, plan. So we need to do a lot to both monitor whether young adults are enrolling and also make sure that they do. The Medicaid expansion, which is now uh, a state option, as of last week, 25 states have indicated that they were planning to expand Medicaid and the remainder were showing a reluctance to do so. The expansion is critical for this young adult age group because of the slide that I had earlier that showed how much they are lagging behind adolescents and other adults in terms of public health insurance coverage. And some of the states that are not planning to expand include ones that had very low eligibility levels for young adults prior to the ACA. Um, in addition, young adults who are under 100% of the federal poverty level won't be eligible for subsidies. So if they're in a state that doesn't expand Medicaid, that only has a Medicaid eligibility level of 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, there's a group that will fall through the cracks. Vulnerable populations who are at high risk for multiple health problems um, include groups that were talked about yesterday and will be talked about some more today, former foster youth, those who've been involved in the juvenile justice or criminal justice system, and homeless individuals. And um, they are going to be both at great risk of not getting the health insurance coverage that they need and then of being at greater need for health care services that they may have difficulty accessing, even more or at least as much as they currently do. The ACA requires the states to engage in outreach to vulnerable populations. Um, and I put the language here, and they mentioned some, including homeless, unaccompanied homeless youth, the only time that that's been mentioned in federal legislation in connection with health insurance. Um, and in addition, states are required to have streamlined application procedures. And HHS CMS has recently um, taken a 21-page application and reduced it down to three pages for single adults who are not applying for family coverage. And so we have to see how that will work, but it should be an improvement over some of the um, extensive kinds of applications that, that young people have had to contend with in the past. Um, the details of essential health benefits may vary by state. States are supposed to choose, well, states have chosen a benchmark plan. Um, 26 states will default to a federally run exchange, according to data from last week, 
But so it's not clear exactly to me anyway yet. I'm sure there's some detailed regulations that I haven't seen uh, or looked at yet, but what the relationship will be between the benchmark plans and the, s the federally operated exchanges. Um, but it's clear that some services that are important for young adults may end up being limited in scope. And I mentioned that dental and vision is only required service for, for children. Um, as I move to the end of my presentation, um, there are some limits on this no-cost preventive services, which has been hailed as such an advance, and it is a tremendous advantage, including for young adults. Um, but the preventive services without cost sharing may include within its scope screening, but will it include all of the necessary diagnosis or treatment? And so. Um, that can be a problem for young adults who may get in to be screened if it doesn't cost them anything but may not be able to afford the uh, cost sharing for the diagnosis and treatment. Contraception, uh, all federally uh, FDA approved methods are supposed to be covered, but health insurers are excluding coverage of some brands within a method. So that's an important place where a gap may um, be created, and then of course there's the enormous controversy that has been um, raging about religious exemptions and accommodations for religious institutions. And just closing, I will say that confidentiality, while it's been uh, a known issue for the adolescent population for decades, is also an issue for young adults. Uh, privacy concerns are important for that age group as well as for the adolescent age group and can be important with respect to sensitive services and issues of domestic violence. Lots and lots, I use a, a technical term here, lots and lots of young adults um, are on the policies of a family member, either a parent or a spouse. And the billing and insurance claims process can significantly jeopardize uh, confidentiality for uh, that age group in that process um, due to explanations of benefits and uh, other legally required disclosures. So in conclusion, I'll just say that young adults are a population, as um, Charlie Irwin so uh, clearly illustrated, with significant health concerns. They have high rates of uninsurance and low rates of health care utilization compared to younger and older age groups. The Affordable Care Act does have the potential to expand health insurance coverage for them, both in private health insurance plans and in Medicaid, and to expand access to important preventive, acute, and chronic care services. But I think our focus needs really to remain on the big challenges that are before us to ensure that there's success in meeting this promise for the young adult age group. Thank you.